Because I spoke and wrote so much about healthcare reform, I was appointed to the Minnesota Healthcare Access Commission. And we broke um, Minnesota Care up into four different sections, and he made me chief author of two of them. The commission itself, for the two years before we introduced the legislation in 1991, was comprised of every single possible entity connected with health coverage in the state. And we worked very, 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 very hard. We were up all night long, night after night after night after night, you know, just finding that, um, that compromise that disturbed people on both edges, but, uh, but allowed us to come together and pass this marvelous piece of legislation. Primarily Minnesota Care uh, covered people who were employed people whose businesses could not afford to um, provide health coverage for them. Minnesota had another public program called General Assistance Medical Care, and then we had a high risk pool as well. General Assistance Medical Care was for the very, very poor, many, many veterans, many homeless veterans. And now we had Minnesota Care uh, that covered uh, employed people. And then um, Governor Plenty was elected. A man who was raised in a blue collar environment whose success came from an infrastructure that supported individuals, an infrastructure that allowed him to have an affordable college education. And yet a man who thinks that he pulled himself up by his own bootstraps, not realizing that it was the public infrastructure that people before him, uh, Republican governors, Elmer L. Anderson, uh, Arne Carlson, put in place the stepping stones for him to achieve. He thought he did it all by himself and he proceeded immediately to undo all of the stepping stones, affordable college, quality uh, education uh, in our public schools, and the devastation that he did to Minnesota Care. He undid all of the work that we did in Minnesota Care and General Assistance Medical Care. He cut eligibility. He cut uh, the benefits that were allowed under Minnesota Care. And he has left it absolutely devastated. And the untold story is that people don't really know. He's a pleasant enough man to visit with. When I was chair of Health and Human Services, I had many one-on-one -on -one meetings with him. And he was, you know, a good conversationalist. Oh, he's so good at twisting the truth, you know, in his public statements. When he says, no new taxes, interpreted clearly means no new taxes on the wealthy. Let's not move towards progressive income tax. Instead, let's shift the cost of government to sales taxes, to property taxes, to fees, so that you know the whole gamut from affordable college to access to our state parks becomes unaffordable to people on fixed or lower incomes. I think that he imagines himself a self-made person and he believes other people can do that. I think that he doesn't realize what helped him get his education. He doesn't understand that concept that when you build a community where everybody has an opportunity, you have a stronger community. He, again, is into that old culture that says, you know, Americans are individuals, rustic individuals, and they achieve it all by themselves. And the truth of the matter is, we are all more successful if everybody has an opportunity. Governor Plenty is looking at um, ways to, to save, and he decided, just looking, at the budget, the general assistance of medical care, is what he would cut. It's, it's the base of quality of life. And when you look at the percentage of people in general assistance medical care who are our veterans, who've come back, you know, many uh, World War II and Vietnam veterans, because we hadn't started understanding or caring about the post-traumatic stress disorder, the, the traumas that they come back with when they've killed or watched killings, you know, the things that happen to your mind, or 
the brain damage that comes from the the, the shell shock and, and, and bunkers. And these are the, the people who who live on our streets, who live in in secret little corners of our communities, of people who've lost their housing. So Palanti said to everyone, no, I'm not cutting mental health services. Oh, but he undermined their lives. And he took away their ability to work, and he took away their, their ability to live. And they ended up on the street. They ended up on the street. And, and then everyone is hurt. Everyone's interest is compromised, because now we have mentally ill on the street. Now we have mentally ill, uh, you know, affecting the sensibilities of the people who don't know how this works. You know, they'll walk down the street and they'll see the mentally ill on the street and their sensibilities are affected. But the fact of the matter is that had they been able to know what Governor Plenty was doing to the infrastructure for the mentally ill, they would have said, oh no, let these people, let these people have their work. So again, it's the hidden, the hidden work and safety net that isn't evident to the regular citizen. And then the citizen ends up hating government. It's so frustrating to me when, you know, together, together we're government, and together we can, we can build this infrastructure so that everybody's lives are, are more pleasant, you know? And, uh, and Governor Plenty is just not paying attention to any of this and, and destroying destroying it all. I think it is protecting the wealth. Two things, I think, are at play here. One, fear, because they use fear uh, in, in, in very creative and clever ways. Uh, but tied to that is the belief uh, that we as Americans have that we can all uh, achieve and rise, and we can all become millionaires if we want to be, you know, if we just have the right stepping stones. There are these wonderful stories of achievement and opportunity in, in our culture. And so I think that um, using fear and combine that with the, the hope of, you know, each individual has of achievement, that uh, that plays well into uh, a, a current society where people don't know how things work because our, our press, uh, the information that we have, has also become uh, very uh, non-informative. It voices pundits rather than researchers. Today, people don't really understand how we are taxed, how the cost of government has shifted to middle and lower middle incomes and away from away from the wealthy. Um, when I was working on early childhood issues um, in the legislature, I, I was um, invited to a group of local snowmobilers to receive an award. The award only took 15 minutes to present to me, and then they were all so angry about my early childhood legislation, and they took me to the back room with this long table, and there wasn't a friendly face in the crowd, and they said, we just hate it that you're taking our tax dollars and you are giving it to these, these people, these people that live off to the side and they are losers and they are just horrible people. And we're hardworking people and we're not wealthy and we don't want our tax dollars going to these people. And uh, the legislation was supporting uh, people you know, moving from assistance into work keeping a woman and her children on assistance was the cheapest way of doing it. Supporting a person to get an education is much more expensive, you know? And so they didn't like the money in, um, in my legislation that actually helped uh, these uh, single parents get a, an education as well. I would explain to them, well, we're moving forward with what you wanted. You didn't want these people on assistance. You wanted them to go to work, and we're, we're moving them into work, you know, and so nothing was happening until finally I said to them, I know you are great parents because I know your children. I watched you raise your children, and your children are great parents, and I know they're great parents because I go to all the school events, 
and I see your grandchildren excelling. But no, think about your grandchild sitting in the classroom. Here's your grandchild sitting in the classroom. And your child, your grandchild, is clearly prepared to learn. Now here's the child from this other household that you're talking about coming to school, unprepared to learn. That child is coming to school and is sitting next to your grandchild, unprepared to learn. Which child gets more attention from the school teacher? And they looked at my hands and they said, oh, not our grandchild. And then they supported my legislation. And, and it was so exciting. It was worth two hours, you know, because it was so exciting. Because then they understood that their interests were better served by every child coming to school prepared to learn. It takes patience and time, but that's what's valuable. Rather than a governor who's after his own career, who wants to be president, who doesn't care about the people or the infrastructure or the ladder he climbed up. He doesn't even notice, I think, that he is destroying that ladder for the other people. And then he just says things like, no new taxes. And the lower and middle income people know that they are paying more taxes and they think that's the leader they should follow. He doesn't know that that is a code word for the wealthy.